High interest rates, like it or not, they're here and they certainly have been for some time. Today on this special extended edition of UBS Trending, I'll be speaking with CIO's Leslie Falconio and special guest BlackRock Rick Reeder. We're going to take a deep dive into the Fed, inflation, markets, and of course, investment opportunities. All that coming up for you right now on UBS Trending. Hi, everyone, and welcome to UBS Trending. Thanks for joining me today, and please help me welcome my guests. Uh, back to the studio is Leslie Falconio, the head of taxable fixed income strategy with UBS CIO, and our special guest, Rick Reeder from BlackRock. Rick, it's great to have you join us. Thanks for being here. Anthony, always fun. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, um, I'm looking forward to getting into our conversation today. Leslie, good to see you as well. Thank you. So, Rick, let me, let me start with you, Rick. Something that um, obviously requires a little bit of setup here is the fact that the Fed, you know, Jerome Powell is firm about not moving rates until inflation is steadily declining. He said that in his press conference. It was in the statement. But what would we have to see to have rates begin to be cut by the Fed? I mean, look at the dot plot. They think there's going to be one cut this year, perhaps four next year. We're going to get into all that. But he's looking at inflation. He's looking at economic data pretty solidly. So tell me what you saw in the most recent statement and press conference from Powell that stood out to you. So I'll tell you a few things. First of all, it was kind of an odd time because you had the CPI report that morning. So they allowed people to adjust their dot plot. But many of those officials, I don't know if people know this, I sat on this Fed advisory board for a long time. You know, there are different processes. There's 19 people who run all different processes. Some just literally do it themselves. Some have big staffs to do it. Anyway, he gave them the chance to do it, to readjust it. I, I, you know, I don't know if anybody did or didn't. But, you know, when people said, you know, the headlines all the next day were one cut. Then we moved from two, from three cuts to one cut. I don't know. It was literally, it could have been one non-voter. You never know what these dots. I think that what does matter, inflation data, PPI data was, was supportive. The CPI data, and particularly the sticky service level inflation, transportation services, insurance, et cetera, that was sticky high, started to come down. In fact, if you take the three-month moving average of core CPI X shelter, and the reason why I take out X shelter as Chair Powell said, it takes a while for shelter for apartment prices to come down. Three-month moving average is 2.0%. You know, core PCE next month is going to come in with a 0.1 something. We think point low, 0.1 number. So you're starting to move in the right direction. By the way, we just got retail sales as well. And I think it was very indicative of a couple of things that you've seen playing out. Low-end consumer under a lot of pressure. And you see that in, you know, seeing price cutting and the number of the retailers Walmart talked about and a bunch of companies have talked about more couponing, more promotion, more trade down. By the way, even that's in, even into middle and higher income. So, listen, I think it set up the um, the environment where, and I think Chair Powell would like to get there, that in September you need a little bit more. Do you see some softness in the payroll report? Uh, the JOLTS report, by the way, was significant. We also got that last week around uh, a week and a half ago. They also got that in terms of uh, job openings coming down, and particularly in the cyclical areas like retailer accommodations uh, and uh, food services. So, anyway, so I think the environment is there to do it. I think they're going to be deliberate, but I think we're ready. I think I think September will be ready. July, you know, there's some people talk about July now. I think it's highly, highly unlikely. Yeah, I was going to ask you. That was sort of my next follow-up question for you. Do you think September is going to be the next cut, and do you think it's going to be 25 basis points? You know, I do, and I know I've been too vocal, maybe, I don't know, too vocal, but in the media about this idea. And by the way, I'm not saying the Fed should be putting in place an accommodative posture. But if you get the funds rate from five and three to four and a half, you got core PCE running at two seven, you got real GDP running at, you know, two ish, it's pretty darn good. But the rate's too high. It's too pernicious a rate on small business, low income commercial real estate. I mean, you're seeing real stress. I mean, we do a lot of real estate financing. The rollover risk, the rollover financing is, is basically stuck. You know, particularly if you're in office, forget it. But even in other places. So listen, I think I think it's, you know, you got to get it down. And I think you'll get 25 in September. I think you'll probably get another 25 in December. And then, you know, next year, I think you get three to four cuts done. And then you get into that zone of low to, to mid fours. And then, by the way, I think part of how they're going to keep financial conditions from getting too easy too quickly is say, gosh, we're not sure we're going much further or the terminal rate is going to be higher. And that keeps the back end, the 10-year point, from really moving that much where I don't think it'll move much anyway. You know, there'll be a knee-jerk reaction, a rally. 
uh, presumably, but but I think you'll quell a lot of that by saying the terminal rates moving moving higher. Leslie, anything to add to that? I mean, we we agree, particularly with the the two cuts. You know, we have two cuts this year, particularly starting in September. And I think the Fed painted, if you look at their projections, they painted a very rosy picture in terms of having, you know, growth between, you know, 2, 2.1 to 26, the unemployment between 4 and 4.2, reaching their 2% objective in 2026. So, you know, we do see some slowing here. We think the economy will slow, but still remain above trend. But we are looking for that one cut to start in September as well. Yeah. And Rick, just back to you, you know, something that we keep talking about is that the U.S. economy it seems to be incredibly resilient. It seems very healthy. Um, and, you know, last week you said something, I read an article, you said something like high interest rates could be harmful when you're trying to keep inflation low. Um, explain why that rationale is something that you think, and do you still think that after what we've experienced over the last week and a half or so? So I need my 47 pages of charts. <laughs> So maybe, maybe, to, maybe to summarize and not drive people crazy with my too many charts on a page, et cetera. You know, I think there's something really historic that's happened. You, you've transferred, you know, the greatest transfer of money from the public sector to the private sector in history. And the private sector has become a net creditor. It's actually an amazing thing. When you become a net creditor, obviously, a higher interest rate buoys consumption. And then the second thing that's happened is and by the way, you kept interest rates low, preceding this rise in interest rates. So companies turned out their debt, and people turned out their mortgages or or refinance into low coupon mortgages, so that they don't. You know what's happened is just housing slows. So people can't move out of their house. So the impact on high rate is actually quite quite dull. The other thing that's happened that is extraordinary. And this is where I need my thirty seven charts. The aging of the population has been extraordinary. And so what's happened is people who borrow are obviously lower income young people, but the aggregate, when you aggregate it up, the, the massive amount of money that's sitting out there is, is high in, mid to high income, or mostly high income, who have aged, and it's the above 55 year old cohort. And so what you, what you see happening is that group is aged, is a saver, and is getting this immense benefit from higher in interest rates. And then if you then we break it down into services, who spends on services? Health in with health insurance, you know, look at the interesting thing around around auto, but entertainment, restaurants, and then you see this in all the earnings. Like why is it high-end restaurants are doing, you know, although they're they're slowing a little bit, but why is the low-end restaurants are really under pressure? It's because you have a very, very different eco ecosystem for interest rate. Than you've ever had, let alone the big companies that used to borrow, uh, the big tech, you know, sorry, the big manufacturing, oil, commodity, heavy industry used to borrow. Who are the big who are the big companies they spend on R&D? Meta, Microsoft, Google. They're long cash. <laughs> They're actually net benefiting mm -hmm. from higher interest rates in an ironic way. So anyway, point being, and I, again, I don't want to be, you know, you know, kind of say, you're an idiot for saying this. Uh, by the way, my data, the data is the data. And I've had, you wouldn't believe how many economists who sent me notes on it that agree, uh, and some who think I'm an idiot. But the, uh, the, the data is the data is the data. And I would argue at least it's ambiguous as to whether the interest rate is is helping and keeping it high, is hurting inflation, or i.e., if you brought it down, you'd, you'd actually improve inflation. But I know it's not ambiguous. You're killing 40% of the population. That is low income, and and by the way, small businesses are your net bulk of your employment in the country, and you can equilibrate that much more effectively at merely a restrictive rate versus overly restrictive. Yeah, I I appreciate your your honesty about being such a data junkie because I've been in rooms where you're presenting and there there really are 37 slides, but they all serve a purpose, Rick, and I appreciate that you put so much detail into that. Um, we're gonna get to the whole cash on the sidelines thing in a minute because that's another. Fascinating story. But Leslie, you know, we're talking about rates. Um, we're actually seeing the 10 year rate come down. It fell a little bit more today, the yield after we got that retail sales data. Wh where, where do you think this volatility continues to come from? Because even though we're steadily moving inside of a lower direction, it has days where it spikes and falls. There's a lot of vol out there. Yeah, I mean, listen, the Fed stays on a meeting by meeting basis. So, listen, the fixed income market is forward looking, the Fed is backward looking. So you constantly have this reassessing and repricing mm -hmm. of what the Fed is going to do. Now, hopefully, after this previous meeting, you know, we've eliminated some variables in March, which was the hike. I think this previous meeting eliminated the no landing scenario. So hopefully we have some sort of, 
you know, intraday volatility that's lower. Mm -hmm. I mean, over, listen, if you look over the longer period, the move index actually got to a place where it was actually fairly low that we haven't seen since 2022. But you have a lot of the shifting narrative. And Anthony, I mean, think about the non-farm payroll number, right? The interest rates went to 448. A week later, they were 418. That's right. Right, Partially because of, as, as Rick had mentioned, the better inflation numbers, but also some situations that were going on in Europe. So you're seeing a lot of intraday volatility, particularly around that CPI data. But now that I believe there's a bit more convergence, you know, we're still, the market is still looking for two cuts, not one, but it's pretty much within that. The only differentiation that we're seeing is that terminal rate, mm -hmm. right? The market is, is projecting a 3.6. The Fed moved up their terminal, but it's still about a 2627. So I think that's where the variance is still going to occur. But hopefully in the second half of the year, our expectation is that that intraday volatility starts to subside since you don't, we assume we're not going to have in this continuous re reassessing and repricing, but like we said, I mean, fixed income is forward-looking, and that, and that one, when they make that one cut, it'll take those 2025 cuts and move them forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we'll see if that actually happens in September, or like Rick was even saying, it could. There's some talk that people, uh, economists, are thinking maybe even July, which would be such an interesting exactly. move. Um, you and we talked about jobs. Uh, you know, the 872,000 on the non-farm. But Rick, you mentioned jolts. You mentioned AD, we I, we haven't mentioned ADP. Those both declined, and when the unemployment rate went up, so between that and CPI and the retail sales, it seems like the Fed is getting the data they want. So if you look at the opportunities within fixed income, you know, clearly our house view here is that there are great opportunities. We still think quality is a really good way to go. Um, and Leslie will talk more about our, our house view there. But explain to our audience why you also believe that in these conditions and what we're expecting, bonds really are still a really good investment opportunity. So, and by the way, I want to say one thing. I, so I think, like you say, the Fed is getting what they want. But I actually don't really think, I mean, I, I think at the end of the day, you should preserve employment. So, you know, as long as employment's stable and it's not overheating in terms of creating wage, you know, real wage pressure, then I, you know, we, we have a debt problem in the country and we want to keep nominal GDP up. And I think we should employ more and more people. And I think it's great for the whole population. But some softness in the job openings and the overheating, I think, is real. And, mm -hmm. and I, like you said, I think, that, I think that is what the Fed would like to see without an overheating dynamic. Anyway, what do you what do you do with that? Listen, I, I think I don't like it. Like I said, I don't think rates are going to drop like a stone. I think there are going to be, you know, I think they're going to be erring on the side of coming down. And I think the Fed will try and try and prevent a significant easing of financial conditions. Of to, I don't believe in it, but they, they, they're going to reaccelerate inflation. So, uh, so what do you do with that? I just would buy a lot of income. Mm -hmm. Like I think today, I mean, that's part of why it's so historic. Like you can buy things like agency mortgages. You know, we've been buying, we've been rotating a bit of credit in agency mortgages, but we like staying high quality. We're still good with credit. We don't think default levels will be really low, save triple C part of the high yield market. We don't think we need, we have a little bit of EM. We don't think we need a lot. But gosh, you could build a portfolio at six and a half to seven yield, own some. I keep looking at my background that I have uh, Ireland up in the background. But I, I, I've been buying Irish debt. Like I, I mean, it's, <laughs> but I like European debt. Like you swap it back to dollars and Europe's got a bigger problem. You know, Europe's got a more persistent difficulty in terms of keeping growth up and they got to get that rate down. You can't create velocity of growth. And, and by the way, inflation's come down faster in Europe. So we like buying European debt, high quality debt, investment grade credit, parts of the high yield market, double B high yield in Europe. We don't go a lot lower than that. Swap it back to dollars. You get some unbelievably nice yields and you can keep your yield six and a half to seven without extending out the yield curve. And, you know, we're going to go through an election. Um, mark my words, a ball on the back end of the curve is going up. And the, um, I know, I think you can build a really nice portfolio that um, that's pretty resilient and complements an equity portfolio, you know, without taking a lot of beta or duration risk. Yeah, especially as, um, as uh, equity markets are just continuing to, I mean, the S&P makes a new high seemingly every day. But Leslie, mm -hmm. let, me, let me ask you to jump in because it's almost like Rick and you have kind of the similar pages in your playbooks when it comes to investment opportunities in the markets. Just reiterate some of the house view items that CIO believes. Yeah, I mean, listen, agency MBS has been our preferred allocation for quite some time. And, you know, like we said, some of the underperformance or underperformance relative, say, versus investment grade corporates, for example, has really been more of a, a technical, not fundamental. I mean, you know, Rick had mentioned, you know, most you know consumers have a mortgage rate that's four percent or below. So that sort of negative convexity that you think about the agency MBS market really hasn't been that prevalent. But it is very subject to interest rate volatility. It's highly correlated to interest rate mm -hmm. fall. 
And as I'd mentioned, with this reprice, with repricing, recessing constantly over the past year of what the Fed is going to do, it's faced some. It's definitely has faced some headwinds. But you know, that's one of that's by far one of our favorite sectors. It's still one of those sectors that not only are they cheap versus other high quality like corporate credit, but just themselves are cheap because you're still about a standard deviation cheap in terms of spread versus history. And to have that kind of, you know, AAA liquidity, given where we are in the cycle, we think is fantastic. I mean, we have stuck, as, as you know, Anthony, with the higher quality. Um, you know, it's, it's had some of the sectors in higher quality have done very well that we took advantage of, like the CMBS side that really got hurt in 2023. We've stayed high quality within that sector, even though, you know, triple B CMBS index is up almost 13% this mm -hmm. year. But again, I mean, we have to be selective about that, but we still go for, and we still like that higher quality, but recognize that going forward, most of that, something like an IG corporate, is gonna come from carry and price appreciation, not spread compression, yeah. right? And also it's the assumption too, that listen, cash, we'll talk about this later, but you know, cash has earned to see at the table. There's no question over the past year. I mean, year. the rate you're getting on cash Absolutely. is just hard to ignore. And some of these higher qualities have, have underperformed because of the rise in rates. Right. You know, we, we expect that to, you know, sort of um, switch in the second half of the year. Yeah. What about that yield curve, though? I mean, it's, it, it's actually two plus years. It's his, the longest yield curve inversion that we've seen in history. And it's deepened a little bit recently. What's going on there? And, and does that actually tell you anything about what's coming? Well, you know, it's interesting. If you look back, I mean, you've had, you and I have had this conversation so many times. Mm -hmm. you know, way back when the yield curve first inverted, it was like recession. And I'm more of a believer that it's a coincident indicator, not mm -hmm. a cause. And listen, I think that the yield curve inversion has had uh, positives and negatives. I mean, Rick mentioned some of them in terms of, you know, corporations being able to earn a lot of carry in terms of that cash position. They've been able to readjust most sectors, I mean, you, high, you have a higher cost of capital, but with that said, they were able to term out debt, um, you know, years back, which is has helping them. Obviously, keeping this sustained at this period of time is going to be difficult for some of these lower quality corporations. But I think, as Rick mentioned, really where it's hurting, in particularly, is the, when we tier the consumer. Right? We have auto loans, credit card loans that are really, really high, and you're seeing this rising delinquencies for some of these tiering sectors and you know some of the absolute rates that we're seeing we saw back in you know today we're seeing back in 2012 when the unemployment rate was about eight percent right you know, not four right so I think that listen I think the inverse arcs expectation the curve will normalize right um, it'll probably be more of a first quarter event you know if growth goes as we assume and if we just have two cuts this year but the, the curve will normalize and I think that the biggest thing is to really try to collect a steady income stream and, and, you know, in today's market versus having, say, money market funds where you might have that reinvestment risk, you know, three or four months ahead. Right. Well, it's interesting because, Rick, let me, let me ask you, because, uh, you know, we talked about this a little bit earlier. There's something like $6.1 trillion in money market cash that's sitting on the sidelines. And you can't deny the fact that some banks are offering 5 6% on that money for six months or a year. Uh, it seems like people are, are thinking, investors are thinking, well, it's a nice guaranteed 6 5%. Why would I mess with that, especially not knowing what's coming? So what do you say to people who say I'm, I'm staying in cash? Uh, I think Leslie said it right. It mm -hmm. deserves a seat at the table. Like, it's pretty hard. I'm not, you know, I manage, you know, I have my own and my family's uh, relatives' money, which is always nice because they're my toughest critic and second-guess me all the time. <laughs> they wouldn't be family if they didn't, you know? My uncle's an orthodontist, so he's <laughs> Empty spline of the yield curve, but anyway, but it's so the uh, the you know, what they always say it's the third seat at the table, like full stop. And, and by the way, you know, I'm not, I don't think the long end of the yield curve is a hedge against equities anymore. I think cash is a hedge against equities, and I think income is a hedge against equities. So I think you got on, I think you have to have some cash. That being said, the convexity of fixed income now is incredible. In the uh, you know, I would say, you know, one thing I didn't know Leslie said that I mean, agency mortgages are great. You can keep your agency mortgage exposure at the lower coupons. Like we, we most, almost all of it. You know, I run this ETF called Bank. Like I love trading agents. You know, I trade the three and a halves. Like, you know, current, you know, prevailing mortgage rate is in the high sixes. Like that thing is not very, is not very convex. And it, and by the way, people, it, it spreads wide and tight. We use it as a tactical allocation, and it creates a lot of yield for us. Like Leslie said, it's pretty reasonable. And parts of, like I said, a high-quality commercial mortgage market, and, and we've been doing more bespoke financing. Everybody talks about office. Oh, my God, it's broken. It is. By the way, Class A property in, in New York, fully leased up, is actually pretty good. But, the uh, but you know, hospitality, multifamily, uh, logistics, warehouse, obviously. I mean, there are some good financing in commercial real estate. So, I don't know, why not, not. Like, if you build a portfolio today that gets you, you know, six and a half to seven, and our ETF is like 690 now, 
high triple B rating. We use a lot of good, you know, agency mortgages, investment grade credit, European swap back to dollars. We keep our duration at two and a half years. You can create a really nice set of stability and your convexity of return. Like let's say let's say I'm wrong and inflation's higher, Fed's like it should be nuts. But let's say they say we we gotta raise rates here. You carry, you know, when you're at carrying at six and a half to seven, you're getting almost 60 base points a month in just carry. So I may be wrong on rate. I don't think I could be. Certainly I've learned more than a few times in my career. The um but I, you know, we make 60 a month, you know, it's a little different price performance you get quickly, but you make 60 a month, you make it back really quickly. And that's a different paradigm. And that's part of why. You know, if I'm six and a half to seven, I think that I think the trajectory of travel for the Fed is to lower rate, maybe eclipse six and a half to seven. You know, we should assume spreads widen a bit if rates come down. But maybe the six and a half to seven is an eight to nine or, you know, maybe a 10, probably not. The um, that's pretty good. And, you know, it's, you know, cash is five. Pretty good. Keep seat at the table, like Leslie said. But, boy, I'd augment that with, um, you know, and by the way, if rates move lower, significantly lower, you know, if you're running a decent quality portfolio, you know, equities probably are not doing as well with an economy that's significantly slower and causing the, the Fed to move faster. You know, if you keep your income and like less said, the curve will steepen, you know, stay in that front to belly. Well, I think you can still create a nice hedge and, and ballast in a portfolio for equities. Rick, thank you. Perfect way to end our conversation. I want to thank you, of course, for joining us. Leslie, thanks for being in the studio with us. Rick, uh, you're, you're such a great partner to UBS. We appreciate you so much. Great to see you. Thanks. Thanks for having me. With, even without charts? Thanks for having me. <laughs> even without charts? we got to see this guy in person, though. It's a, it's, a, it's a spectacle. It's a sight to behold. Rick, thanks so much. Great to have you on. Thanks for being with us. Thank you all. Appreciate great. it. Thanks, Leslie. And Thanks. for more information on anything coming out of our great partners like BlackRock and others, make sure you're visiting our Insights website at UBS.com forward slash views. Plus, there's also incredible content there from Leslie and the rest of the Chief Investment Office. Plus, you can follow UBS on social media. All the major channels, including Instagram, are dedicated at UBS Trending, where you're going to find a lot of studios content there. And in the meantime, if you have any questions about what we spoke about today, which I feel like you might have some questions after this, make sure you're talking with your financial advisor. Until next time, I'm Anthony Pastore. Have a great day, everyone. And remember to keep your eyes on what's trending. We'll see you soon.